So, this is an odd place to begin, but um, this is not the sermon that I want to give. I usually feel like I have something of a choice about that. Um, for the past two weeks, I've been, they've been very full. I've been away two weekends ago at uh, Camp Aldersgate in the foothills of the Adirondacks, preaching for a weekend on Ephesians. And then this past week, I just came back from Lighthouse Camp, where I preached all week long on Ephesians. And did you notice where the epistle passage came from today? Ephesians. (laughs) You saw that, didn't you, Paul? Um, And I thought, well, that's low-hanging fruit, because I've just preached at least twice on that. In, in that particular passage, 3, 3, 14 through 21. But I, I, just, I just couldn't shake the Spirit's prompting in the last several days that Second Samuel is critically important for our culture today. Um, so I, I need to give a little bit of a public service announcement, I guess, at the beginning. This is, a, this is probably at least an R-rated sermon. And, and um, for those who've experienced some of the things that happen in this story or something like unto that, when I talk about abuse and things like that today from this passage, they could trigger some things. So I just want to say, you know, if anybody, you know, if there's a place of if there's a place of tenderness or some open wound that is there, I want you to be encouraged to talk to somebody, somebody in the congregation, one of the pastors. And since many of these things that I will reference happen most to women, we have two wonderful women pastors who will be honored to serve and others as well in the church. So I just want to say that at the outset. But our culture in general and the, and the Christian world in particular has been riddled, absolutely riddled with, with revel, successive revelations of moral failures. The, the Me Too mo- movement It was a term that was actually coined back in 2006, but gained widespread attention in 2017 through social media and through the resonance of the problem with so many people, drew really much needed attention to a pervasive culture of sexual harassment and assault and unequal treatment and disrespect against women. And the list of moral failures that have weighed down our culture and the church is um, just too long to even imagine. I mean, on the cultural side, which of us of a certain age didn't, didn't love growing up watching the Cosby show. What a guy. We all trusted him and loved him. In fact, when I finished my doctoral work, he was the person selected way back then for to be the commencement speaker. It was before the news came out that for years and years and years he had abused women even using drugs in drinks to put them in a state where he could do whatever he wished with them. And the Christian world has fared no better. Many Catholic dioceses are in bankruptcy these days. Churches are losing pastors when things come to light. 
I mean, think of Bill Hybels and James McDonald and apologist Ravi Zacharias and Anabaptist theologian John Howard Yoder whose books are just so good and founder of extraordinary large community that ministers to developmentally disabled persons, Jean Venet. And add to that the countless unknown, unannounced, unspoken, hidden sexual transgressions and moral failures. And the weight is heavy. Today's Old Testament passage is the story of the tragic fate of a faithful Jewish couple at the hands of an evil king. It's the sobering story of disempowerment and oppression, the abuse of power, the abuse of privilege. I actually tried when I was thinking and praying about this to figure out a way to preach this passage without giving David the benefit of being named because victims so often go unnamed and unnoticed. But ended up deciding that it's important for both the perpetrators and the victims to be named for different, very different reasons, but they need to be named. And so I simply want to, in the next few minutes, to walk through these three main characters in this story and maybe put them in the context of some of the great literature and what, what, what part would they play in the story. First, there's Uriah the Hittite, who in this story is, plays the role and not only plays but is, is the innocent soldier and faithful citizen of the story. The scripture is consistent that Uriah is a Hittite, which means what? Which means that he's ethnically a foreigner. He's probably from what's now known as the region around Turkey. But the interesting thing about the Hittites is that the Hittites are listed in Deuteronomy chapter 20 as one of the, uh, the arch enemies of Israel, along with the Amorites and the Hivites and the Jebusites and the Hittites. And somewhere along the way, this Hittite has become a part of the community of the Hebrew people. He's become a person of faith in the living God. Somewhere, whether himself or his family, must have converted to Judaism for his very name gives honor to Yahweh. Uriah means Yah is my light. Maybe it was his parents who came in and named their son Uriah. But truly, Yahweh was his light. For in this story, Uriah is the epitome of loyal service and faithful citizenship. Did you notice the reading of the scripture? Two times he refuses in David's scheme to cover up what he had done trying to make sure that Uriah had the opportunity to sleep with Bathsheba so nobody would know that the child in her womb was not Uriah's and would assume, of course, and they even perhaps, or at least Uriah, would assume that it was his. Two times he refuses to go home while the army and the Ark of the Covenant are on the battlefield. How can it be for me to go home and lie with my wife while my comrades and the very presence, the symbol of the presence of God are on the battlefield? I have to be there. And so he sleeps the first night outside. 
And David says for the second day, well, stay here and rest. You're tired from your journey. And, and he has him drink too much, thinking if he gets uh, a little drunk, he'll surely go home. But he didn't. He's the epitome of loyal service and faithful citizenship. Uriah in this story was exactly where he should have been in every way. Physically, spiritually, emotionally, relationally. And then we come to David. To David who in most every other page of scripture is celebrated but not, not, not here. In this account, David is, to use the most sanitized words one can use, he's the villain and the perpetrator of the story. And in direct contrast to Uriah, David is not where he should be. Verse 1 underscores that in the narrator's words so, so clearly. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David, the king, remained in Jerusalem. David was precisely not where he should have been, and the narrator wants everybody then and now who reads this passage to know that. He was in the wrong place. He wasn't doing what he should have been doing. He was not only in the wrong place physically, but he was precisely in the wrong place emotionally and spiritually and relationally, and all of that came tumbling down in his life. Another observation we can make about David was that David was in what is clearly a God-given position of power. Remember the story of, of Samuel to David's father, Jesse? Don't you have any other sons? That's none of these. Oh, yeah, I've got the youngest. He's out tending sheep. He's tending the flock. Bring him in. <laughs> That's the one. And he's anointed to be king. He's in a God-given position that now he abuses for the sake of his own private gratification. What a, what a sobering reminder that even the most respected, the most admired, the most accomplished people are not immune not only to temptations, but particularly to the temptations of what's available to them through power. And this passage says something else. It gives us insight that, that those who have power are the most likely to have the potential to use violence. If I have the power to do it, I'm more likely to use it. And so there's no other way to say it except that, except that David is an adulterer. David is a married man. His actions are in direct violation of the seventh and tenth commandments. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. And though, and though it's not in this passage, one can look at the larger story and perhaps see that David had a problem reigning in his own sexuality. If you don't, if you don't even include the supposed engagement of David to Saul's first daughter, Merib, and then his marriage to Saul's second daughter, Michal, you don't even include those. Prior to this abduction of Bathsheba, David marries Abigail and Ahinoam, 1 Samuel 25. 
And 2 Samuel 3 lists four more wives in addition to those, Maaka, Haggith, Abitel, and Eglah. As one commentator pointedly and poignantly summarizes, so then, before he sends men to abduct Bathsheba for his use, David has sexual access to a minimum of six wives. Seven, if you count the banished Michal. And in this culture, that doesn't even count. The sad reality of the slaves and servant women and prostitutes which Israelite men could have sex with with very little, if any, consequence. Got really quiet in here. Sorry, I don't want to preach the sermon. But the undeniable additional observation about David is that David is a rapist. Though some commentators have tried to soften it, there's absolutely nothing, nothing in this passage to indicate that Bathsheba is a willing participant. David is the person in a position of power, a position of power of which he takes advantage, and he takes the advantage of a subordinate. It's exploitation, it is violence. And often unnoticed in this passage is the direct echo of Genesis chapter 3. Do you remember in the sin in the garden in Genesis 3 of the sin of the first humans? It says, in the garden the woman saw something beautiful, something good, tov, and she took lacha. And here, this passage so clearly says that David saw something beautiful, tov, and he took. By the way, both NIV and RSV soften it. David, by the way, has a, has a pattern of sending. He sent Joab into battle. He's feeling his power. He sent people to take Bathsheba. He sent word by Uriah himself with his death notice in hand back to Joab. He's sending a lot of stuff. This, this, this is so, such a clear parallel. David then, as it tumbles out, and he has to try to cover up the thing that he's done, now David breaks the third commandment and becomes a murderer. You see, a last summary about David is simply to say that David is out of control. He doesn't think so but he's out of control. You see, it starts like this. He could have, but he wouldn't, control his lustful passions. And because he wouldn't, though he could have, then things became completely out of his control. He could not control Bathsheba's pregnancy. He could not control Uriah's principled loyalty. And he could not control God's moral judgment. We get the part of the story that's in chapter 12 next week in the lectionary readings, but it, we don't, just before that, this chapter ends after our reading ended with these words, the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Most interpreters see this narrative 
as the pivotal, the pivotal moment of the whole story of David. From now on, his reign would be marked by war and bloodshed and death until he dies. As Walter Brueggemann has observed, for David and for Israel, we are at a moment of no return. Innocence is never to be retrieved. From now on, the life of David is marked, and all Israel must live with that mark. Yes, the story will find David in a place of forgiveness and pardon. And we will pray Psalm 51 with David. But make no mistake. The horizontal consequences of David's actions never go away. And those of us who have been or are caught up in this kind of action and temptation will create consequences that will never go away. And then there's the most important person in the story, and that's Bathsheba, the victim of the story. Bathsheba, like her husband Uriah, and unlike David, is exactly where she should have been. She's on the rooftop bathing because she's just had her period, and that ritual bath is something required by the law, and she's a loyal citizen of the community of Israel, and that's what she's doing. And she has no reason to believe that anyone else will be able to, from their roof, see the top of her roof. Except, except for one dwelling, perhaps, and that's the dwelling of the king. But of course, the king couldn't have been home because we're at battle. She's not an exhibitionist. She's not flirtatious. She's simply keeping the law because she's faithful and doing what she knew she was called to do. According to the temple law, she's unclean during the days of her period and must partake of this ritual rite before returning to, the, to temple worship. A dichotomy, as one <laughs> uh, commentator summarizes, the dichotomy of being gifted by God with the ability to bear children and then being branded as unclean because of that gift is a matter that still plagues some churches and some cultures. Bathsheba is right where she should have been. Bathsheba is objectified. She's seen only as an object for personal gratification. You know that word take we just talked about? It's also the Hebrew word that is most commonly used for purchasing a commodity. You go to the market and you pay money and you take something. She's been commodified. She's been objectified. She's been violently abused. And, and please, please don't go down the road of thinking, well, she could have refused. <laughs> this is not that culture. <laughs> An ordinary woman does not refuse the king. She, they didn't go, go to get her. They didn't fetch her. They went and took her. That's what it literally says. That's where it softened in many translations. She's violently abused. 
But then there are two glimmers of hope. One glimmer of hope is that, that Bathsheba has a name. I'm so excited to come to this passage and find that this abused woman has a name. It's one of the highlights of the whole thing in a very dismal passage that she is actually named. We know her name. Do you know that only 9% of the personal names in the Hebrew Bible belong to women? Most people who have gone through this kind of trauma at this level or something other go through life unnamed and unnoticed and forced into saying nothing. She has a name. We live in a day and age where we need to say the names of victims because they represent a life and they represent a family and they represent hopes and dreams. Say their names. Honor their life. And then we have to notice that Bathsheba has a voice. Many people after such things never find their voice. Only by the grace of God. After some time, there, there's no quick instant pregnancy test in this period of time. It's probably not until her next period should have come around again that she has some idea that she's actually pregnant or until morning sickness begins. That she doesn't know until she knows. And then with, with courage and boldness, there's this little mini speech. It's the only words of her in the story. She sends word to David, I am with child, I am pregnant. She didn't keep quiet. As some commentators actually have the audacity to suggest she should have done, because that would have apparently saved her husband. Instead, she called David to account. You know, there are many applications of today's passage, and my time is way far gone, and I thank you for being patient listeners. When I look at Uriah, I think, could, could I be like Uriah too, Uriah? Could I be that person? In the story of my life, will people be able to look back and say, here's, here's a loyal servant and faithful citizen of the kingdom of God? I want that to be me. And I look at David. And the truth of the matter is that I see myself there too. I see myself in the place of maybe not to this degree, but Jesus said, if it's even in your heart, didn't he? I don't want to be the villain and the perpetrator in the story. And yet to deny, to deny that that possibility lurks in every one of us in this room is to deny the reality of what it means to be human. In denying that reality, we can never be rescued by the one who is truly human. And most tragically, there are 
no doubt people in this room who have had experiences akin to Bathsheba. And perhaps you've been made to feel nameless and voiceless and defenseless. Like a commodity or an object. And I want to say, I'm sorry. Sorry for whatever complicity I have had I'm sorry for the culture which breeds it and celebrates it. I'm sorry for the brokenness of our world. I don't know what the Lord would do for this, with this message for you and me. But I pray in these moments that we'd be open to God's presence. To heal, to hold, to love, to strengthen. Amen.